Oh, I'll watch it without. Um, hopefully, people will um, be doing this, what's sometimes called sketch noting and visual noting. Um, and our first session, uh, first talk, will give you a little bit of an introduction. If you want a quick look at how to do it and some examples, I tweeted this morning uh, that tag. Um, some links to some amazing sketch notes. Um, and while Lynn has some amazing uh, material on sketch noting, there's an amazing book coming out very soon called the Sketch Note Workbook by a guy called Mike, and I think he's printing it in August, and I was lucky enough to see a draft, and it's just amazing. He's got contributions from hundreds and hundreds of people, how they use sketch notes in every context imaginable. So if you're really interested in getting into it, that's a good source, but you can always start with Lynn. Um, we've already had a random survey before by, by hand. I asked a quick little question. How many people have been to a tea tasting of exotic teas? Can you raise your hand? Okay, not too many. Okay, the, the ceremonies tend to be, you know, it's almost like a production line. You're offered different teas to taste, and, and some of them you might say, hmm, yeah, okay, that's, that's interesting. And then others you might say, mm, yeah, okay, that's interesting. And then others you say, wow, that, that's interesting. That's really interesting. These lightning talks are going to be a bit, little bit like that, okay? So I can guarantee that what you hear will be interesting. <laughs> so so we, we have about 12 speakers. Um, they've all got a five-minute time. They've got a timer. You won't see it. Um, hopefully they're going to inform and expand your mind and intrigue you, but because we have a reasonably broad audience, we can't guarantee that each talk may be your cup of tea, but don't worry, it's only five minutes and you can always sketch note it and have lots of fun anyway. Um, we've got a bunch of people ready to give you talks. Um, hopefully you'll have an invigorating experience. Lightning talks usually work on like 20 or 30 people and it's a lot more informal and there's whiteboards and all these sorts of things. So um, I'd like to think of this as lightning talks at scale. Um, and so you're probably part of what could be a Guinness Book of Records thing, but we're not into that sort of stuff. We don't do metrics. Um, okay, enjoy. Um, quick time check. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, can I introduce Lynn Kazali? Thank you, Eric. Let's plug in. You're going to see live dynamic technology. This woman does not need a mouse. She does not need Google Glass. She has no, her she finger. Needs, uh, she needs a screen switched oh. over. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh, there yeah. you go. There, you go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Technology, who needs it? So good morning to you. My name's Lynn Kazali, and in the next few minutes, I want to set the scene for you so you can get the most out of today's session. And I didn't actually do that, so we want, we want that up. Eric, what did you press? Yeah. <laughs> so to set up today's session, you're going to hear some awesome things throughout the day. And I want to make sure you capture those key points that are impressive to you, that you capture the thoughts that you have about what you might do with what you've heard, and that you also document some things about what you might follow up or act on today. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a compressed version of my book, Visual Mojo, and give you some quick sketching hints and tips about how you might capture the stuff that uh, is impressive to you today. So let's say you're in a session, either the next talks or later on through the day. Make sure you write the title of the session, person's name. You might want to write the fact that you're at last so that you remember these notes when you see them. And then imagine this person says something awesome. Write down the essence of that quote and then, as Marcel said, give it a nice speech bubble, which helps you capture and focus your attention on this key point, this thing that you were uh, interested in or appealed by. If you're having some thoughts about what people are saying, then capture those too. Write them down. Go speech bubble. This is what I'm thinking, cartoon style. Let's say someone is giving you some advice. Maybe there's something to add to um, perhaps 
key points they've made, key thoughts you're having, but they're giving you some advice. I like to capture hints, tips and advice in a sort of road sign effect. So let's say they're telling you it's almost like turn left, turn right, or some suggestions about what you can do with information you're hearing today. Then use that shape or use that sign as a way to capture that point. So instead of just writing words from the top of the page all the way down, look at how you can use the page in front of you to capture some more, I guess, organic thoughts, organic thinking. If someone refers to a book and you think, yeah, I'm going to chase that up, I want to find out about that book, draw the book a little cover and then pop the title of the book there and go, yeah, that's a book I'm going to, to um, chase up and find after today. Let's say you have some great thinking in terms of ideas based on what you hear from sessions and what you see and do. Write those thoughts out, give them a shape so that your eyes focus in on that information and if you've got an idea based on what you'd like to follow up, then have a crack at the old light globe, the universal icon for innovation. Squiggle, 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 circle, squiggle, squiggle, dash, 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 dash. And then when you zoom out and you look at the notes you've been taking, instead of it being a long linear list, you're going to have some pockets and some sections that your brain's going to be able to process a lot quicker. Our brains and eyes are looking for patterns. And in a list of linear words on a page, we tend to see scrawl. So visual notes and visual thinking and visual mojo gives you a bit more confidence to segregate information and help you zoom, zoom in on some of those key points. And then following on from today, let's say there's some stuff you'd like to follow up. I love to write a list that I'll call action and then I put it in a super cool block arrow indicating forward progress from left to right. So I might have a list of hints that I'm going to, or stuff I'm going to follow up from today, and it's that page that says action that captures my attention and keeps me looking. And if there's something you loved hearing from someone, draw a love heart. But most of all, listen to what people are saying. It'll come straight out of their mouths. They'll give you suggestions about icons to draw, pictures to sketch, or keywords to capture. Most of all, sit back, absorb, and let your brain do some processing and sorting for Visual Mojo. Now, you've got a Sharpie when you're um, welcomed today. I encourage you to bring that along to this afternoon's session. And I'm running uh, a session called Canvas Thinking. So I'm, I'll have a bunch of the big canvases on, uh, on the wall, like business model canvas, the lean canvas, the value proposition canvas. Bring your Sharpie along and there'll be an opportunity for you to create your own canvas this afternoon and, uh, and I'll be sharing some more visual mojo. But I'll be here on and off throughout the day and um, look forward to seeing your contributions to the doodles. But most of all, um, capture your thinking for your own benefit first so that you'll get the most out of today's sessions. Uh, there's going to be lots of information shared, lots of ideas, thought bubbles, lots of things said, speech bubbles, but most of all, get some shapes and patterns around your thinking so you can make sense of it after today. Thank you, Lynn. For those who are keeping track, she finished with three seconds to go. <laughs> okay, now this is the most technically challenging. Oh, she's done it for me. Oh, how's that? Wow. Um, okay. Uh, now he just realises. Hang on. What have I done with a short break for breathing? Returns with the technology. Um, okay, that's an example of a lightning talk. Um, hopefully you've got some ideas and hopefully some of you are wielding your sharpies and ready to go because we are now going to hear from David Clark. Now, did anybody here go to Comic-Con? Oz Comic-Con a couple of weeks ago? Mm, yes, yep, okay. You might see some slides in here that you relate to. Um, prepare to be taken on a journey. Um, How do I get it up on the screen? Oh, aren't you? Oh, we just... Hang on, sorry. Oh. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, hi everyone, my name is David. I'll be talking today a couple of times about chaos. Uh, later on I'll be talking about um, the theories behind chaos, uh, some processes you can use, some techniques you can use, but right now, in the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about mindset. Okay, so I was a software developer. I lived in a world of truth and beauty. One plus one always equal two. Uh, whenever I put the same thing into a computer, it gave me the same answer. It was wonderful. And then I became a project manager. <laughs> Suddenly, those beautiful linear relationships were gone. I could not draw a line from input to output. It was never the same thing twice. So I'm sure you've all used pair programming. You put one programmer and you add one programmer. Do you get two programmers worth of output? Maybe. Or maybe the programmers argue. Uh, they talk about source control. They talk about naming conventions. They spend the day arguing. Someone locks the source control. No one can access it. One plus one actually equals zero. Or they get along really well. That's good, right? No. No, it's not. Because they decide that what they want to do is put a backdoor in the program, access it later when it goes live, hack the database, and pull out credit card numbers. One plus one equals negative infinity in that case. Um, as a PM, you feel you have to make one plus one equal two. But do you really? I mean, if it can equal negative infinity and it can equal zero, surely it can equal ten. So it wasn't an easy transition. I went from being a software developer. It was wonderful to being a PM in a large project, non-deterministic, a complex adaptive system. And those of you who've dealt with Kinevan, you've heard the word complex adaptive system quite a lot. Um, the mindset that worked as a developer will not work as a PM. Don't try and force your projects to be linear. Don't try and force 1 plus 1 to equal 2, because it can equal 10. Look for the opportunities to equal 10. So that brings me to mindset. How do you do that? So you're in charge of a project. I've got bad news for you. You are not the captain of the ship. And you are not charting a logical course to a known destination. You only think you are. You're actually the master of a fleet of ships. Every team, every individual is an individual. As the master, you can't overrule them. You can only persuade them. Your ships are hunting for treasure in wild, uncharted water. So what do you do? Your task isn't to chart the way. It's to continuously clarify a shared vision of the end of the journey, the riches at the end of the journey. Shared vision will define goals. It will motivate the team. You've got to answer the question, what's in it for me? You want your team to be motivated? What's in it for me? Developers are often uh, intrinsically motivated. What's in it for them is intrinsic, not extrinsic. And define the boundaries of the search. So the business wants a CRM. If you give them a really cool calculator, you're outside the boundaries of the mission. So you must ensure that every ship understands their own resources and capabilities and those of the ships around them. And then your ships need to cooperatively plan the search paths. So that's not you, that's the team. And then you're a coach. One plus one equals ten. Exploit your nonlinearity. Okay, so that's the mindset. How do you create it? Very shortly I'll be talking about that. I'll be talking about reconnaissance understanding your environment, using experiments to understand your terrain. I'll be talking about Taleb's theories of anti-fragility and resilience. Taleb is a very interesting guy and I think he will resonate with you. I suspect you haven't encountered him before, but you've encountered systems thinkers very like him. And we'll talk about dealing with the unknown. When to build anti-fragile systems and when it's better to go res for resilient systems. Okay, and I've done it in exactly 4.30, which is exactly what I promised. Wonderful. <laughs> Even better, it was 4.27. Um, we now have a tag team. Um, okay, yep, tag, I'll give you that. Um, Dan and Andy will be 
giving you an interesting story about a startup and, and close relationships with the board. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll be facilitating a session at 2 p.m. How lean is your startup? You don't have to be doing a startup or have done a startup to be interested in startups, but just since we've got everyone here, who's done a startup? Show of hands. Can you please come along? Because I need your help. It's a facilitation. I'm not presenting for an hour. Thanks. Um, but um, we'll be looking at startup techniques, what you need to know, and even the place of, um, of these um, lean startup ideas in innovation. Okay, so we thought we'd give you a little taste. Um, we're going to reenact the origin story of our startup, upatch.com. And this is Andy, my wife. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm trying to get, turn a picture of Groucho Marx into a quilt pattern. Oh, how long is that going to take you? Oh, look, it's really fiddly. It's like, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be about a 10-hour job. Oh. Yeah, that doesn't look like a job for a human to me. Um, tell you what, why don't you explain the process to me slowly and carefully, and I'll hack together a program that'll do it, I reckon, in a few seconds. Awesome. Go for it. And about 10 hours of programming later. Here you go. Oh, that's awesome. Can we change the colours? Oh, just make another change. <laughs> um, fantastic. Can the program tell me how much of each fabric to buy? Uh, just give me a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm off to the sewing machine. And a few days later... We had... Ta-da! <laughs> And a few days after that, hey, I was wondering, you know, we just turned a 10-hour job into a couple of minutes on the design. Do you reckon other people might, other quilters might pay for that? Oh, absolutely. Really? Yeah, look, pixel quilts are really big at the moment, but there's people who are sort of holding back from doing it because the design process is too tricky. Oh, so we just throw up a web page, they send you the photo, you send them a PDF. Ka-ching. Um, even better, what if we had a website where people could put their own images in, and then they could manipulate the image and generate their own PDFs. And so the idea was born. And less than six months later, after the weekend hack, our site was launched. Um, so let's talk a bit about what we learned. OK, so under what circumstances does it make sense to do a startup with your spouse? Well, I think the most important thing is that we started with an idea that we were both really excited about. Um, I was excited to do something a bit new in the, in the quilting world, and I think you were a bit excited, excited to get your hands back into doing some coding um, and excited to use some of your agile and lean knowledge in, in this startup process. Um, we had a really complementary skill set. I obviously had the domain knowledge, and you had the technical skills to, um, to make it all happen. Um, and we actually had a period of time where we could focus on it. You were between jobs. And and um, I was not working outside the home. Um, our kids are at primary school, so we had those school hours that we could, we could work on the project. And late at night and when you couldn't sleep and those other times in between <laughs> and sometimes when the kids were watching TV. That's right. And what were the biggest learnings for you? Um, well, I'd never worked on a startup before, so there was a whole lot of new stuff for me to learn, um, a lot of new skills. I suddenly found myself in the role of product owner and um, had to really quickly work out what that meant. Um, I kind of knew in theory what it was all about, but had to work out what, what I would actually have to do. Um, I found myself doing, developing new skills like making instructional videos, doing user testing, provide, doing marketing, customer support, all, all that sort of stuff was new to me. And um, also I had to, for me, a concern was making sure that this didn't impact negatively on my kids and on our family life, so making it work in that context as well. What would you say were your big learnings? Um, yeah, well, I got to, uh, well, what were my learnings? Um, so I'd been involved in a startup before, a more traditional one. It was VC funded, thanks to my team. The development was agile, but it wasn't lean and it, it didn't end well. And after a few years' time out, I really wanted to try the lean startup stuff, but looking at the business side experimentally, um, doing the minimum viable product, that sort of thing. And I found that, hey, it, it works um, well for the... The, the goals that we defined, which was to, to spread our, our thing to the world and to, um, to cross something off the bucket list. The, the, the fame and fortune. The fame is doing okay. We're in a few magazines. Yep. So it wasn't that hard. It was scary, but we could do it. Um, the fortune, still working on that. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> 
But, you know, I found that there were gaps in my skill set too, on the, especially on the business side, but those were doable. You know, you can download open source um, shareholder agreements and work from them rather than going to lawyers. It's not that hard to trademark or register a company, that sort of stuff. Um, and we are just about done. <laughs> okay. Um, and into double over time. Um, so, essentially, if you think, even if you don't want to have a start-up with your spouse, come along at two o'clock and we'd love to have a chat with you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you. That was very interesting and an, an amazing scarf as well. And we are now moving on to our... Uh, oh, 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 sorry, brain. Uh, <laughs> yes, the quilt. Yes, get it right. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, hang on. Sorry, going backwards. Let's go forwards. Okay, Steve Lawrence. Here he is. Here is the microphone. And Steve will be sharing some interesting pictures of what actually happened with the um, Blues versus Red this week. Oh, okay. Touchy subject. No? Yeah? We'll talk about the. the oh, you want? Yep. Right, uh, rugby's a game of the play in heaven, you'll know that, right? Just on that, uh, Dan and Andy, um, if I had to do a start-up with my wife, I think there'd be a third party involved, and that'd be the divorce lawyer, so well done. <laughs> um, Agile's a team game. This is my team, South and Rugby team. We hadn't won that shield for 60 years. It's like the FA Cup. Um, there's no All Blacks in that team, so it just goes to show that team is really important. You can achieve wonderful things if you have the right team. But that's not what this talk's about. We're going to look at business transformation versus IT optimization. Um, trying to make sure that as the people that are executing and delivering on the work, that we're on the same level as what our C-level execs are. Um, I went to the FST financial conference in Sydney, I think it was late last year, and there was about four CEOs and CIOs on top of a panel, and they all talked about transformation, customer first, and agility. And they're all trying to outdo each other in terms of what they thought they understood by those terms. I would hope they understood what customer first meant, but I'm pretty sure they have no idea what transformation actually means or what agility actually means at a sea level. Um, so the first thing we've got to do is make sure, A, we're not just on the same page, but we're also reading the same book, or we're going to be really misaligned in terms of what our journey looks like. So that's um, a diagram I came up with to try and explain what a business transformation looks like rather than IT optimization. So from a, an IT optimization point of view, we start trying to optimize our delivery process. And we've spent probably 12 years doing that in terms of the agile movement since about 2001 and even before that. And I think we're pretty good at it, but we're pretty constraining on our process if we're only looking at how we optimize the delivery part of it when we've got a deployment process which slows us down and our input process is a real mess as well. So to be successful in terms of our business transformation, I'm just going to try and see the time. Cool, heaps of time. Um, we've got to understand that IT are just enablers. We don't own the outcomes. So we shouldn't be the people in control trying to dictate how things are done. We've got to align ourselves with our business customers to make sure we're doing what they want and need rather than what we perceive they actually want and need. To be successful for a complete transformation, you have to create an internal practitioner network. You can't just have a lot of coaches coming in, they're going from team to team to team to team to team and expecting to be successful. You've actually got to create that internal hub of knowledge that can carry the journey forward after the coaches, etc., are gone. Got to have leadership and support. Agile predominantly has been driven bottom up and we know that isn't successful, it isn't sustainable until we get that leadership support to start driving down and enable us to go wider than just staying at the delivery teams. Training and coaching, of course we need that, but it's to a point. If we can start creating that external practitioner network, it'll be sustainable and it'll keep growing going forward rather than just leaving when the coaches all leave as well. Um, not to mention one organisation, but there's a few of you here from the communications company. A lot of them went through um, Agile Fundamentals or Agile Overview training and then you'd go in there and do a, a team launch or coach them and they would all ask, can you go back over that stuff we learned about 18 months to two years ago? So they were all trained but they didn't use it as soon as they were trained so it gets put in file 13. Business engagement, absolutely critical. Um, you need to align with your, your business customers, understand their, their business. It's a classic, who here is an IT BA? Don't you find that strange? 
Look at the name, business analyst, and you're sitting in the IT department. Really, really strange. So you need to align with what the business wants and try and make sure that you understand their needs rather than trying to perceive it from an IT perspective. And of course, we need some kinds in there. We need continuous innovation and improvement. We need to understand the motivation of not only the business, but also the individuals delivering the work. What motivates them? How do you form teams that will be successful? How do you create an organisation where people just don't come to work to, to take the paycheck and go home? How do you drive that success where people want to try and become emotionally involved and emotionally attached to the organisation's success? And of course, you need to look further than that. Real estate. How do you co-locate your teams? How do you put them in an environment where they can be successful rather than cubicles or a battery farm of people sitting in desks just working side by side beside each other? HR, KPIs and how people are rewarded is really important. Um, typical project managers, KPIs, on time, on budget um, and fully scoped. How important is that versus giving a customer what they actually want and need? And legal, you've got to start looking at the contracts. How do we actually put forward contracts that meet the needs of the business rather than just trying to lock it down so there's no room for change. And I think I've got eight seconds left and of course you need some systems and tools underneath it all to help support the journey rather than dictate the journey that needs to support it and make it visible and transparent. Thank you Steve, we're right to time. Um, how many people have been watching the World Cup? A few? Yeah, okay. I, I was supporting the Netherlands as I usually do. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, I'm a little bit confused as to who the next people might be um, supporting. Um, if they have big smiles on their faces, um, there may be a reason. Uh, this is actually another example of a startup, but the, it's more like an incubator. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, do you have the time? I have the time. Timer, timer, timer. Oh, right, okay. Oh, okay. No um, hi, um, this is Victoria, I'm Bernd, and we are having a session later about peer groups. And uh, that's actually a very cool alternative to performance reviews. That's what we want to talk about later. And um, to have a good peer, a peer group, it's actually very essential to give good feedback. Like, in general, it's good to give good feedback, right? That makes sense? So, um, yeah. Yep. So, um, I guess if you just ask yourselves, you don't need to put your hand up or anything, um, but if you ask yourself how comfortable you feel in giving feedback, the first thing that probably comes to your mind is, oh, feedback, Ooh, it's, it's, you know, you have this association that feedback is always negative, or I only give feedback if it's really something that I feel I need to get out of my system, whereas we actually want to talk about um, now and later as well, that feedback is really, really valuable, and it's not about negative. You don't need to make it a negative feedback experience. So here's something you will don't get in the next session, which is um, examples of bad feedback, like really, really bad feedback. So one example is um, personalized criticism. Like, you are awful. Uh, sorry, not you, sir. It's, yeah, like, in general, like, as an example, if someone says to you, like, you are awful, like, or you are useless, or you are and then some bad adjective, right? That's actually a very bad thing to do because it's actually personalized criticism. You're not talking about the thing that the person actually did, you're talking about the person itself. So, and that's bad, why? Well, I mean, it doesn't really give you any, anything to work with. It's just criticism. You don't really know what to improve on. You don't really um, feel supported. It's really just an attack. So you perceive it as an attack. So a lot is about perception as well. So, and another bad thing is actually a, a judgmental comment, like what you did was awful, what you did was useless, period, nothing more. Just saying to someone, well, that was useless, right? That's actually not very helpful at all. That's not constructive. I don't know what to do with that feedback. I know that I did something bad, so that's even better than, well, personalized criticism, right? But still, it doesn't give me any option how to, I could do better. So that's just another example of bad, bad feedback. So, and then there are uh, smaller things, like you don't ask permission about giving feedback, like just 
blurting it out, yeah, so not asking, are you actually ready to perceive, like to, to actually get that feedback right now? So another thing like bad context, bad timing, or the person is just in a bad mood, he's not ready yet, yeah, so, um, and, and very, very bad. Criticism in front of everyone else, like if I were criticizing my, my wife over here right now. No, okay? I don't do that. So, no, no, no. I, I don't dare. So, but in general, like don't, don't do that, for example, in a stand-up or something like that, right? And I, we, I've seen that plenty, like giving feedback in front of others without asking and so on. And moving on to the good side, like what is actually good feedback? Um, you... For example, I mean, the thing he ben mentioned um, in the end in regards to context and um, making sure that the person is actually um, able to, to receive feedback, just check in with them. Actually ask them, are you up for getting some feedback? I'd love to give you some feedback. I'd love to share some feedback. So make it a pull rather than a push because um, that's already going to set the stage for your feedback experience. Um, the other thing is make it specific, so make it about points that the person can actually act on it. So rather than saying you, you, you're useless or this is useless, actually explain what you've observed. Um, when you did this, this is what, what the impact was on me. Um, so there was one thing I learned um, a couple of months ago, which is impact feedback. So make it about an observation. Say, okay, this is what I've observed, and this is the impact it had on me personally. Because that makes it about a choice. If I give Ben feedback... Um, and tell him what the impact was. It doesn't mean that it's good. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's not non-judgmental. It's open. It gives him a choice. Does he want to, to have that impact on me by acting in a specific way or not? So make it about a choice. And um, very important as well is create awareness. So the most important part is create awareness in a person that you want to give feedback in and make them own the piece and give them responsibility in how they want to act on it. Again, it's about choice. Um, so a good thing actually to do in giving feedback is also ask questions. You can, you can say, for example, how do you feel about this piece of work to get them to reflect on it. So it's about awareness. So that's just a couple of ideas on how you can give feedback um, because we're not going to cover that in the session this, after, uh, this morning. But there will be a session at 11 o'clock? 11.05. 11.05. Um, I forgot the room. It's about peer groups, and if you actually um, got something out of that right now, you most certainly will get something out of that session too. So that's a little bit of advertisement. Cool. So definitely give it a try. It's worth it. <laughs> okay. See you later. Thank you very much. Thank you. And not, not one mention of Deutschland über alles. Excellent. Let us welcome Mr. Pig Cohen, and he is going to talk about wonderful things um, and quick survey. How many people volunteer time to coding or community initiatives? Good, good. Hopefully we can keep asking that question over the years and the numbers will increase. Pete. Thanks, Eric. All right, so I'm going to be talking a bit about shared value and I would like to start just to move on. Crash. Oh, here we go. Now we'll all move on. Okay, let's start with a question, which is why we're we all here today. If you're like me, <coughs> we're here to learn. And we love what we do, so we want to ma <coughs> excuse me, ma <coughs> master our craft and get better at what we do. So, great place to be, last conference for doing that. But there's another factor to it too, which is the bottom line. A lot of what we talk about with Agile and Lean is about how can we make better products more efficiently, reduce costs and increase profits for the people that we're, that we're working for. But of course, not all profit is equal. Um, some uh, companies make profit at the expense of the environment or the society that they're part of. And a lot of companies, like probably a lot of the ones that we work for, are relatively neutral. You know, we don't cause mass destruction, but we don't necessarily leave the world in a better place than how we found it. So what I'll be talking about today is this concept of shared value, and that is about how we can simultaneously do business, make profit, but also leave the world a better place. A little bit of history on the concept. This guy's Milton Friedman. He's famous for saying, the business of business is business. So that's in line with that view that corporations are just there to increase shareholder profits at, at any type of cost. You'd be more familiar with this, um, this recent concept of uh, corporate social responsibility. So that's where 
organisations will donate part of their profits back to society, um, perhaps, yeah, donations or uh, letting their staff do volunteer time. But this more recent concept is creating shared value. And um, the quote here is that it's about policies and practices that enhance the competitiveness of a company while simultaneously advancing the economic and social conditions in the communities in which it operates. And really central to this idea is that it's businesses that are best placed to solve society's problems. It's businesses that can innovate and that can scale better than governments or not-for-profit organisations, for example. Um, the concept was first put out there by a famous economist called Michael Porter, so you can look that up if you'd, if you'd like to find out some more from him. Um, so there's some big sort of scale famous examples of this. There's a big clothing brand called Patagonia you might be familiar with. So they make clothes for uh, outdoor adventure sports type thing. They, their profitability, their business relies on um, there being a pristine environment for people to want to go out and do those types of adventure sports in. So instead of them investing in, you know, how can we make our products and apparel as cheaply as possible, they're investing in innovations and technologies to how can we um, reduce the impact that creating this stuff has on, on the environment and the people that make them. Uh, the organisation I work for, DS Computing, a technology consultancy, um, we're on this journey of how can we incorporate shared value into what we do. And so a couple of examples of things that we're doing. One is that we're working with a, a social enterprise called With One Seed, who do reforestation in East Timor. So the business challenge that they have is how can they audit these massive plantations of trees so that they can be um, traded on the carbon market. For us, our, one of our problems as a technology company is that we want to get into um, deploying sensors on quadcopters, which is heaps of fun, by the way. Um, and so we found an opportunity to, to work together with them to um, we're launching a commercial pilot for how can we help them solve their, their problem and us of how can we um, expand our knowledge in this particular technology. Another example of, um, is through our work as the regional uh, partner for Random Hacks of Kindness, which is sort of in line with what Eric referred to before. Random Hacks of Kindness, for anyone not familiar, or ROC, is um, about bringing together volunteer technologists with problem owners from the community, and we create software for social good. So one of the benefits that Deus gets from this, for all the, we put in a fairly significant time and, and money to it, but it's a fantastic opportunity um, for us to try new technologies and, and languages in anger. So if, as an example, our Android capability started there at Random Hacks of Kindness working on a community problem. We got our fitness up and then now we're able to practice with that, that commercially. So yeah, I'll leave you with a, another question, which is how can you take what you learned from last today back to, to your organisations and businesses and look for opportunities for how you can create shared value, um, still make profit, still do good business, but leave the, better, the world a better place than how we found it. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Spoke till two seconds to go. Well done. Um, next, we're going to hear from James Holmes. Now, a lot of people mightn't realise that Lightning Talks originally came out of, I think, the Pearl community. Um, so they've got a very strong developer heritage. Um, so in, in line with that policy, I decided I, we needed to get a really strong techo developer talk. Um, and this is it. <laughs> and you'll see it. Not quite. Okay. Let's... Oops, hang on. It helps when you hold the UI the right way. And for those who are of a technological nature, this is in widescreen. Yes, this is an adventure in what happens when a developer goes to one of Lynn's talks and decides to draw their slides, so it should be funny. Hey, that even worked. That's great. So, yeah, that's me, and I'm just a developer, so I'm not a BA or any of that kind of stuff. So, I wanted to talk about Kaikaku, which is unfamiliar to a lot of people. Most people know something about Kaizen, the improvement um, concept from Japan, really. So I'm going to start by talking about Kaizen. We start over here. We're doing something in our project. And we decide, okay, we want to get better at doing this, which is great. However, think of it like you're on a slope, but actually you've got a blindfold on and all you can do is jump one direction. 
and then measure out whether you got higher or lower because that's really all you can do when you try something. You really don't know if it's going to work or not. So we start off with one. Jump. Oop, I'm lower. Damn. So you've got to go back to where you did and maybe try a different direction, which is what we do at number two. And then number three. So finally, ah, good, we have an improvement. And now the Japanese definition, actually, of Kaizen means not only just doing this, but then turning that into a new standard through the plan, do, check, act cycle. Some people will have heard of that. It's um, an involvement um, of the Deming cycle. What plan, do, check, act really means there is plan for a change, do the change, check that it actually made something better. If it didn't, you go back. If it did make something better, that's your check. The act, the fourth part, is create a new standard to stop you slipping back down the hill. That's a really important part that sometimes we miss is the standardisation part because we think, well, standards slow us down. But no, the standard is the next thing you challenge when you go back to this. However, you're also possibly on a hill that has a top. So you might, the next time you do it, oops, I'm down the other side. So I reverse and I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Oh, ooh. Eventually you find the top of your hill. And teams will find that when they're performing really well, the, it's really hard to improve past a certain point. They wonder why. Take this with me. The why is because you're part of a system. And systems have balancing forces. And they move. So this starts happening. We're standing still. All of a sudden, then the little, all the tectonic shifting that you didn't really notice on your hill because you were too busy moving around on it, and I'm standing still on it now, all of a sudden the plates move and I'm starting to sink into the Pacific Ocean. So now I've got to move just to actually stay where I was because I've got to, you know, sort of jiggle around a bit onto a different part of the hill because it's changing shape. At that point, when you've approved as much as you can and your constant improvement is just to keep up, that's when you need something other than just the Kaizen small increments with standards. You actually need the next part, which is the innovation part, which is Kaikaku. Kaikaku actually means a leap of faith into basically a whole new area of your system, usually based on somebody else's experience, you would hope. But the thing is, you're almost inevitably going to be, inevitably, going to be worse off. Point 10 is lower than you were before, but now you start Kaizen again, and eventually you'll find the next top of the hill, which is way up there, if you're lucky. And then you do that whole thing again, and that's the whole point, is you have to keep on doing that whole cycle again. Um, I've got 30 seconds. An example of that in the real world, think about someone who is in a traditional organisation, they have excellent contracts, they have, um, what are the other things we do, excellent um, systems to control people, you've got all this brilliant documentation, all that sort of stuff, but you're not developing the right thing. So then you've got to jump over and just start with something else. You might try Scrum, you might try SAF, you might try anything, but then you can start improving from there. That's it. Perfectly timed. Spoke to the second, spoke to the absolute second. Our next speaker is Evan. Now, I've noticed a few things. One of the, one of the problems with a tablet as a UI is it's insanely obvious when someone's taking a photo. You can be a lot more subtle with a, a camera. It's good to see people taking photos. Hopefully there's a little bit of Twitter activity. Um, you know, there's, we could only fit in this number. There's probably people sitting up in the middle of the night in all parts of the world following last. But, so they need something to... to some reason to stay awake. Um, Evan has microphone, Evan has clicker. Um, Evan, Evan had a, a single slide, it was, had a beautiful elaborate background, unfortunately technology being what it is, I had to simplify. So this is not, this is like the MVP, okay, apologies. 
All right, it is what it is. So, I'm a manager, an advisor, an author. I was a developer a long time ago. But one of the things that I learned about how to be a good developer is it's not about the software. The software is the least part of anything that you're trying to create. So, if I can put it in terms that some of you might understand, leet skills are not enough. What we're trying to do is build a product in a context. Now, that context is important, and what does that mean? Let's take a step back and look at what we're trying to achieve. In the first instance, we're trying to build something for a customer. Does that make sense? That's why we're doing Agile. We're not just building a product for the fun of it. So, what I want, when I'm running a project, when I'm running a product or a company, I'm going to look for people who have passion. I will hire passion over software skills any day. Why? Because skills can be learnt. Skills are something that say, I can do this. Great. I need someone who can do this, but I also need someone who can go the further steps and drive it further. So, in the next minute and a or couple of minutes, I'm going to be talking about some of the soft skills that you're going to need in the software world and the software industry. I'll cover about five. Number one, who here likes having meetings? <laughs> All right, yep, one of you, two of you, very good. So, most of us hate meetings, but meetings are critically important and they actually provide a valuable service in collaboration and getting a lot of people onto the same page and hopefully of the same book. So, let's look at different ways that we can hold meetings. What about an agendaless meeting? What about a meeting with an objective? I'm going to go into this meeting. I'm not going to have an agenda, a list of dot points that we need to cover. I'm going to walk in and I'm going to say, we're going to be in this room until we come to an agreement on whether we're using Perl or Python. And we'll sit there until we have, that's the purpose, that's the objective. The meeting solves, a, meets that purpose, meets that objective, and we move on. All right, point number two, let's look at communication. Now, communication covers a whole facet of different components, writing, talking, drawing. So, let's talk at talking for a moment. Talking is something that people do badly. I do it badly, I, and I'm standing in front of 400 people trying to talk. Trying to convey a simple message in a couple of words is critical in any environment. Whether you're writing a piece of code and are trying to talk to another developer, talking to your customer, talking to your project manager, your boss, whoever you're talking to. So, here's a little thing for you to practice. In your daily stand-up on Monday morning, put together a little process that says, in five words, I want you to describe your weekend. Full stop. Just keep it very simple. And over time, you will find people will start to learn how to communicate. They will learn how to talk. Let me give you a couple examples. In five words or less, David Clark's talk earlier, Agile takes advantage of chaos. Is that pretty much the summary of that talk? I'd like to think so. The Schiffers, feedback, when right, is important. Five words. Peter Gowen, do good. There you go, two words. Nice and straightforward. Holmes, uh, I'll summarize and just say redeeming, and that will pretty much cover most of it. <laughs> so, you can summarize complex concepts in a small amount of words. Yes, you lose precision. Precision versus accuracy. A one hour, a two day training course can be summarized down to a couple of sentences. You, you, lo you lose the depth but you gain the ability to communicate an idea succinctly. And I've just spent a lot more than five words to say all that, so bad me. Moving on. Writing. Writing is nothing more than editing. You write something, edit it, read it again, edit it. If you feel you're bad at writing, just practice editing. Much easier. Negotiating. You need to discuss who and what and why you're doing things. You may have an idea about something that you want to do, and your customer or boss disagrees, learn to go negotiate with them. Compromise, learn to compromise. Now, in the eight seconds I've got left, 
Business development, time management, cognitive biases, drive, mentoring, giving feedback. Wonderful things. <laughs> Thank you very much, Evan. Um, as you can see, there's many, many different styles of presenting. And one of the great side effects of going to lightning talks is you get to see how a lot of people present. And one of the good things about this sort of forum is obviously if you're presenting to this many people, you have to practice and you have to get your time remarks right. And I have to compliment the people on how closely they've been using the time, you know, their five minutes. Um, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, this, this is a slight change of tempo, shall we say, to our previous talk. Um, this is Alexander with a handful of slides. Can you start that timer? I need oh. a minute. Okay, um, so I've been at a, a large organisation that's implementing SAFE, so this is my take on SAFE. So first of all, important context is the E stands for enterprise, and things are a little different in the enterprise. So enterprise is characterised by many, many people, and sometimes even the IT departments could be four times bigger than this conference, for example. There are also complex and complicated organisation structures with matrix reporting and dotted line reporting, and sometimes it feels like accountability is very hard to understand and that everyone's accountable for everything until something goes wrong, and then you find out that you're probably the person accountable. There are also multiple initiatives on at any one time. So if you think about your Agile transformation, well, there could be a Six Sigma program, there could be a estimation Kaizen program, there could be putting everything in the cloud program. And all of these change initiatives need management um, and they're all going on at the same time. So it's very hard to get some focus on your Agile transformation sometimes. And large organisations and lots of change initiatives mean that lots of communication is needed and communication happens in the enterprise by lots and lots of meetings. So I'm glad you talked about meetings, Evan. There are also, as well as embedded practices in the enterprise, there are also embedded tools and templates in the enterprise. And this is my top seven list of tools that are hurting your agility and innovation. And not only are these, and the brand names have been removed to protect the guilty. Um, not only are these tools heavy and antiquated, but they're also often mandated. So we haven't done enough to, rail, to roll out Agile in the context of the enterprise. So I've been around Agile um, adoption for 16 years, and I still find myself talking about stand-ups and story points, and I, won I wonder why that is. So we're hard to understand, and we don't speak corporate language well, so we want to talk about MVPs and, and iterations, and that just doesn't translate to corporate people. And we don't really like these big org things. So we don't like meetings, we don't like PowerPoints, and we don't like structure, and we don't really want to follow corporate rules. But we also don't want to fight to introduce Agile because we're not really fighty people. We're kind of peace-loving peaceniks that like to talk and do the right thing, um, but we don't want to have to fight. But we have to fight. So we have to fight because our brothers and sisters are dying in the enterprise one day at a time, um, governed by um, org charts, governed by um, Gantt charts, governed by work breakdown structures and estimates, and we have to fight to help scale Agile to the enterprise. So SAFE comes along and says, I'm a framework that will scale Agile to the enterprise, and we find ourselves asking the question, is SAFE the answer? So SAFE is not the answer, and I'm missing a slide, but that's okay. Um, and, but there are a lot of great things that you can get from SAFE, and let's go through those now. So first of all, lining up iterations is excellent. So eventually, when you're doing a lot of agile work streams at the same time, and you're working with each other in lots of multiple agile teams, you start to realize that lining up the iterations is a really sensible idea. It facilitates many things, such as you can do joint planning, you can find a cadence, um, and you can do things like innovation hack days on the same day, and it just makes everything a little bit more organized and easy. All in planning, I think everyone who's doing SAFE in this room would agree that one of the really great factors of doing SAFE is having this all in planning and why not let teams sign up to their commitments instead of having commitments put, a, put on them and why not all get in the room and discuss that together. The sharing of work is really great and SAFE as well. You can easily identify where one team is really smashed and one team is very light on for work and, and why not help each other and I've seen our teams hand work over to each other. Um, in these all-in planning sessions, which I think is really great because sometimes as agile teams we become very insular and we only really want to work on our own stuff or perfect our own team's performance. 
because we have these joint sessions and we're learning from each other and we're doing it at the same time in these nicely lined up iterations, we have this chance to um, see what each other's teams are doing and get visibility. And this is great for managers, they can see what their teams are doing, but it's also great that teams can see what other teams are doing. So the safe gotchas to watch out for is for getting to train people in Agile. So people often say, yes, I know Agile, I've worked in Agile before. Um, quite often that's not the case and you find yourself having arguments about teams that keep finding the scope. There tend to be people everywhere in the enterprise and in release trains people can stick to you. There seem to be people everywhere and everyone wants to help. And that can mean that your release train ends up looking like this. So if your release train looks like this but you still only have four developers on your team, then you're doing it wrong. Sometimes you forget about why we're trying to be agile and we forget that it's about achieving great customer results and our purpose starts flying out the window much like this little bird when we start to think that what our purpose is really about trying to do safe and if that's our purpose then that's a bit wrong because that means that we're sort of fixated on one idea and that can be dangerous. So what have we learned? We've learned that safe is in the context of the enterprise and things are different there. I'm going to just talk louder now because I can hear the alarm. We aren't moving fast enough to bring agility into the enterprise. There are lots of great things to take from safe and then there are some gotchas to watch out for. This is a silver bullet. Safe is not a silver bullet, but it will help you if you want to scale Agile to the enterprise. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, when I first got those slides, I thought, hang on, is this for the lightning talks or the mainstream? And some people have already said to me that they have less slides in their mainstream. So excellent job. Excellent job, Alexander. Um, next, we're going to leverage um, some of the, the topics of that talk with Stefan and Ed. Yep. Um, so this is a little uh, survey um, and they're going to be talking about crowdsourcing some of these ideas. And here's Stefan. Oh, hang on. Oh, just this. Yep, yep, yep. Does this work? Yep. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stefan Decker and I probably need to click. Oh, I've got to click. My name is Stefan Decker and I'll be doing the talk with Ed O'Sheehan over there. I founded the IT Practices Community. Uh, it's a crowdsourced approach to solve common issues that we find in the IT world um, to help you achieve more. So it feels like a five minute introduction to what we were talking about. There's a lot of talk going on around SAFE at the moment, the Scaled Agile. Um, part of this community is about bringing people together to focus on each other's problems and to facilitate workshops for each other to solve each other's problems. Um, you are part of a Lean Startup experiment at the moment, so welcome. Uh, we have an um, um, assertion that we want to, a metric that we want to validate is out of this group of a couple of hundred people, uh, we can get at least five people at 12.30 in the hall to do something called a dialogue mapping. Who knows dialogue mapping? It's sort of a um, mind map workshop. Um, to have a think about the common issues that we have and potentially start solving each other's problems or parts thereof. Um, I want to hand over to Ed as he is uh, leading the Agile Guild, as we started calling it yesterday, of uh, the IT practices community. Oh, that helps. Cool. Thanks, Stefan. Hi, Ed O'Shaughnessy. Um, so what we're really interested in is how do we actually um, scale agility? Um, it was a great segue from the last talk. Um, what we're looking to do is use all of you here as a cross-section of the population. Um, this is going to be a bit like stage diving for me. So... <laughs> If you all suddenly part, I'll crash onto the floor. That might be amusing, but not useful for me. Um, and this is an Agile conference, so anybody know the Lord's song? I'm kind of getting tired of putting my hands in the air, so I'm sorry I'm going to ask you to put your hands in the air. Um, it's good practice for all the other sessions that are going to follow. I hope you haven't got low blood pressure. Um, <laughs> so we've come up with four, sorry, five items. Um, that we're interested in getting your feedback on. And so it's what is your greatest concern 
for scaling agile to the enterprise. Now, I'm sure some of you aren't in enterprises. You maybe you're in small uh, web shops or whatever. Um, but just kind of put yourself in that headspace. Imagine that tomorrow you've got a wonderful job in a huge organization and they were talking about scaling agile. What would be your top concern? So we're just going to ask you to vote on each one of these. And rather than counting hands, which would take forever, um, Stefan and one of my colleagues over here are going to take a photograph with each vote. And then afterwards, we're, we'll actually analyze that and decide which is the top one that we want to explore um, with the dialogue mapping out in the foyer. So I'll just go through these quick explanation. So first one is building effective geographically uh, distributed uh, teams. So that can mean teams that are offshore. That can mean that you've got in your company teams in different regions. It could mean you've got a huge office block and one team's on the ground floor and one team's on the 25th floor. Okay. Um, upholding the agile values of individuals and interactions. We don't want to lose that. Investing and contracting models. That's always a huge challenge in the enterprise. Realizing emergent architectures because we want sustainability at scale. And how do we perform just enough planning and control? So we'll just go through each one of those and I'll ask you to vote. So um, if you believe that number one is the most important, put your hands up. Number two, put your hands up for that. And we'll, we'll take it from there. So number one, if you think that's the biggest concern, hands up. Yeah, okay. yep. Cool. Thank you. Number two, upholding the agile values. Number three, investment and contracting models. Number four, realizing emergent architectures. And number five, performing just enough planning and control. <laughs> Fantastic. That's Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. Um, While we're switching over, we'll be publishing uh, the topic in the hallway. And hopefully, if you feel passionate to contribute, We'll be out there at 12.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very impressive use of the crowd. Um, okay. And if you're interested, go to their follow-up session. Most of the, the speakers today do have other sessions. So the other thing is there's a few areas just around near here where you can probably have discussions if you want to chase some other speakers, maybe at lunchtime or in the breaks. Okay. Our next speaker is Venkatesh, and he's going to talk about building self-organising teams and is all your technology. Um, as a, as a, a small request, three minute version if possible. Perfect. I'll do that, right? Yeah. Can you hear me? Two minutes now. Okay. Can you get my slides? There you go. So how many of you have heard about self-organizing teams? Right. So if you are in the agile business, then you would have already heard about self-organizing teams. One of them, there are many misconceptions about self-organizing team. And the popular misconception is you get a team of people put them in a room, give them the freedom to do whatever they want to do, don't ask anything, be a servant leader. If they come back and say that it takes 10 story points, don't question them. If they say that this is what we want to do, just listen to them, make them happy, measure the team temperature. As long as they are happy, you have a self organizing team. That is the most popular misconception. And what you're doing is actually you're not building a self-organizing team. You're actually just creating a happy team without delivering any value at the end. And probably you might be encouraging some bad behaviors as well. So in order to build a self-organizing team, there are actually certain requirements. First and foremost, you need to have a leader. This is another popular misconception. People think that self-organizing teams, that there are no leaders. That team is on their own. 
there is no should no one should be there to direct them to build a good self organizing team you need to have a good space they need to have a good environment they need to have the right set of tools to um, produce results you need to have a right mix of people as well and i know this is a bit controversial one of the popular misconception in agile teams is you should never put pressure on the team you should give them the freedom to do whatever they want but it's totally totally against what self organizing team take talks about they need to have a little bit of pressure there should be a little bit of constraints as well on the team i'll explain these things a little bit detail they need to have a clear goals and there should be a passionate leader keeping a watch on how the team is actually doing and performing if you don't have these ingredients then you cannot build a self organizing team let me give an example with an analogy of build, preparing soup what do we need we need the ingredients we need to have tomato we need to have herbs we need to have salt we need to have the right mix of ingredients you cannot just have tomato and say that i'm going to prepare soup you need to mix them very well then you need to have a proper container and you need to put the right amount of heat and it is not enough you need to keep stirring these ingredients until they mix well just putting them in the pot and then boiling them is not going to prepare soup you need to keep stirring them and in addition to all these things you need to have a good leader who keep to stir these things and ensure that he needs to taste it once in a while to see if it is if it tastes well if the soup is ready and once the soup is ready you need to shut down and then you need to start serving so let us map this to some of the characters of building a self organizing team so you need to have right mix of people very similar to having right mix of ingredients to prepare soup you need to have a right environment like the container and you need to have proper constraints and right set of goals for example heating the container is is very um similar to putting a little bit of pressure on the team too much of pressure you are going to spoil or if you don't pressure put pressure at all still you are not going to build a self organizing team if you just put the stove and if you don't switch on the gas you are not preparing a soup similarly if you don't put pressure on the team the right amount of pressure you are not actually building a self organizing team and there should be the leader who would be observing constantly challenging the team if you are not challenging the team if you are just giving them the freedom to do whatever they want to do you are not actually going to build a self organizing team you will build a chaotic team and again there should be a passionate leader to keep an oversight keep coaching keep saying if the team is really moving in the right direction if they are not in the right direction he needs to keep changing the team keep challenging them until they gel well and they start building uh, start becoming a self organizing team so if you are still having a myth and misconception that building a self organizing team is easy it is really not easy so there are few more tips that i'm going to be talking about at my 3 o'clock session which is about irrefutable loss of agile coaching wonderful thank you very much um oh perfect timing yeah okay didn't quite get the 3 minute version but he's counting um for those who voted and i hope the hopefully you all did the preferred outcome was performing just enough planning and control and don't forget the follow up session coming soon. Okay, hopefully you have enjoyed all these talks. Um I'd like to thank all the speakers and also our reserve speakers Bobby Singh and Burnt. Um you can see we've had all sorts of different talks. We've had things that go up, things that go down, things that are a bit low key, things that were maybe a touch more manic. Um we're going to finish with a nice little homely sort of story um from Tony. So, ladies and gentlemen, Tony Hi everyone. Hi everyone. No, still not going. Uh, Hello. Aha. Hi. Um I'm Tony Fifefoot. This is a talk on how we delivered more. Now, before we get into the details, so at the end of last year, we found ourselves in a position where we'd rushed a release out um to get a pre-Christmas release out. Now, as a result of that, we um we had low test coverage and there were some refactoring things needed to be done. So, we we started doing test coverage mondays so after iteration planning we would stop and um not actually build functionality on the monday 
but just focus on test coverage. So this was to increase our test coverage and get ourselves back into a better position. And we did that every Monday. So we, um, we also shortly after started uh, No Meeting Tuesdays, and that's because No Meeting Tuesdays are great. Everyone should do No Meeting Tuesdays. Um, we're about to start No Meeting Thursdays as well because the teams can get isolated and actually focus on delivery and, and achieve goals. So to the results. Um, so as you can see up here, uh, our test coverage increased. Um, not really surprising because we focused on doing that. Uh, our velocity also increased over time. And again, not really surprising. Um, what I did find surprising was this happiness index. So our happiness actually increased markedly. It was a couple of iterations after we started um, these activities, but we've got a, a significant increase in our happiness of the team. Um, disregard that last little blip there at the end, that was a um, project problem that I'm not going to talk about today, mainly, be <laughs> mainly because my boss is in the room. But um, so who thinks that this is amazing, wonderful new stuff? Not many of you. No, it's not surprising at all. It's stuff they've been writing about 15 years in Agile. Um, you know, the, yeah, it's, it's not surprising to anyone. What um, I think caused the happiness to, to change in the teams was that by changing, making these changes, we created the ability um, for the teams to focus on mastery and becoming better. Um, we gave them autonomy and ownership of the code base that they have. And that's really what made them happy. That's really what made the change. We, that allowed us also to align with the team goals and the team um, cultures and their beliefs. That's what made them happy. Now, just another little thing, because I've got, uh, I thought, five minutes, so I can do a couple of uh, different presentations. Um, so I thought I'd talk about the happiness index. Um, we use a very simple mechanism, um, just draw you know, at the start of um, Iteration Retro, we'll um, draw up how you feel. And I compare that, you know, use a bit of artistic license and compare that to a known scale. So I've got a scale of one to five. And you look at some of the pictures and, and come up with what you think the scale is. And this is how we measure it on a weekly or, or fortnightly basis. Um, very simple tools to use and uh, you know, very simple to track this in, over time. You can scale it over multiple teams and put the numbers together and you know, put in reports and things to management. Um, but what I find really useful about this is the emotions that you see in these, uh, these images. So you can see there the uh, you know, skulls sometimes people draw. You see great bloodshot eyes but really happy that they've achieved their goals. Um, you know, obviously the big grinning smiles and happy dogs. And uh, don't be surprised if you get some random things in there as well, such as people drawing pigs, just because they like pigs. <laughs> Anyhow, that's, uh, that's it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. And with 45 seconds to go, isn't that wonderful? Um, hopefully, if you're taking any sketch notes, you will include pictures of every image that he just showed with those cute little animals. Um, okay, we're a little bit over time. You're going to have your break just out there. I would get up everybody here so that you could thank them, but just for now, let's say thank all the speakers. Thanks very much. And hang on, hang on. I, I have a slide. Where's my slide? Where's my slide? There's my slide. Thanks for all the speakers. Enjoy the rest of your day.